السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد In today's um, session, inshallah, we are going to talk about uh, Surah Al-Anbiya, which is uh, mm-hmm. the beginning of uh, the 17th Jews of the Quran. And uh, the whole point of the Surah is to talk about uh, uh, various different Anbiya, alayhim salatu was salam, and that, uh, how, what they did and what they went through. Uh, this is the main subject matter of the Surah, Surah Al-Anbiya. But another important point that we learn from this surah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established two different uh, uh, lines of guidance. The first line is through his kalam and the second line is through his rijal, his uh, appointed people who were sent by Allah for the guidance of the entire mankind. So this silsila or this line of uh, guidance starts from Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and it ends uh, on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This surah gives us a very important message and by the way before I uh, talk about further details let me just uh, uh, briefly uh, tell you what are the topics that we are covering today. So we are going to learn today if is if it is possible for someone to learn and understand the deen on his own does he really need his scholars to guide him and to teach him? So do we need a teacher for understanding the deen? Uh, there are translated books. There are Quran translations available, hadith translations available. That is, if one really thinks that hadith is uh, an important source of sharia. So can we simply rely on translations and without going to a uh, proper training course, can we become scholars and can we... Um, can we claim a scholarship or authority on the Quran and the Sunnah? That's one question that inshallah will try to respond. The second thing is that uh, in Surah Al-Anbiya, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of the Surah talks about various different arguments to prove his oneness and uh, prove his qudra. So inshallah we learn uh, one of the uh, very famous arguments. It is called the argument of Tamanu. Taman or inshallah will uh, elaborate on that. And also, uh, there are a few uh, scientific phenomena uh, that are mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Anbiya that we will inshallah understand. So, the first thing is, can a person become an expert of deen without associating himself to a chain which is going uh, back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Response is, without any... Um, if and but the response is no it is not possible and why is that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nahl in Ayah 44 he says and we have revealed unto you the Quran so that you can explain to the people what has been revealed to them hope that they seek they get advice they get nasiha from it so if uh, uh, anbiya or if rijal, people who are appointed by Allah to uh, provide guidance or to become means of guidance for the people, if they were not necessary, then there was no reason, though no need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, uh, mushrikeen were claiming or were demanding that why Allah azza wa jal chose different anbiya, why he did he choose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how come he didn't send us a book? If book is the kalam of Allah, then we are capable of reading the kalam of Allah. So it is definitely in the qudra of Allah that people would have woke up early in the morning and next to their bed there would be uh, a book properly printed, which is called Mus'haf. And they were told that, you know, this is the book that came last night from your Lord. Simply open it, start reading it and follow, start following it. That all of those things were possible but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't do it why he didn't do it because he established two important lines of guidance one is through his kalam and speech and the first uh, uh, link of that line is those scriptures that were given to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and the last and the most important link of that line is the Quran which is given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam 
In the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about four different duties of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that Allah Azza wa Jal has favor upon, favored upon mu'mineen by sending a messenger uh, who comes from them and this messenger recites to them the verses of the Quran. That's the first duty. The second duty is وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And he purifies them. He does their tarbiyah. That's the second duty. And the third duty is وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Not only reciting, but he also teaches the book to them. وَالْحِكْمَةِ And he teaches the wisdom. So this wisdom is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now this ayah debunks and refutes the claim mm -hmm. of those people who think that hasbuna kitabullah, that kitabullah is more than sufficient, more than enough for us. And if there is any guidance, then uh, we can definitely seek guidance from kitabullah. If this is what they think, then what about the duties of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? In fact, he, did, he, he, sh he shouldn't have been assigned any duty. He should have simply um, played the role of uh, a postman that, uh, who brings a letter from, uh, the, from the sender to the recipient. This is his job. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam would have performed this job as well. Here in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about four different duties. One of them is reciting the book. The second is teaching the book. The third is teaching the wisdom, which is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And fourth is doing tarbiyah. So that shows that anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam are as important as the kalam of Allah for the purpose of guidance. And this is the reason why you have the entire chapter in the Quran, which is called Surah Al-Anbiya, in which Allah Azza wa Jal talks about different anbiya starting from uh, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Harun alayhi salatu wasalam, then Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, then Lut and then Nuh and then Sulaiman and then Dawood and then uh, Shu'aib, uh, uh, alayhi, uh, Ayub alayhi wasalam, and then Zakaria. Uh, and then Isa alayhim salatu wa taslim. All of the, these anbiya are mentioned in the surah and in many different places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not like everyone is mentioned, where is Rasulullah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being addressed by Allah. So he's, 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 he's there first. <clears throat> so uh, by just simply relying on your own personal studies, you cannot be expert of any field. Imagine if you have completed your a high school and you uh, you know some basic uh, terms of biology some basic terms of science and chemistry uh, maybe some physics and then you buy some uh, textbook of medical school and then you read those books you go through them and you can understand either with the help of just simply by reading the textbook or with the help of its keys available in the market and then you claim to be a certified doctor without any license you start practicing obviously you'll be put behind the bars why because you have no authority to even prescribe a single medicine why because it doesn't matter that you read all of those books what matters is that whether you pass the exam and then you did your residency or not if you did the residency then only you'll be issued the license by the state authority so without doing residency, and residency is what? That you work under uh, a, an, an uh, organized and supervised uh, environment. That's where you work and you implement your knowledge and then you learn by practicing. So that's why people will put their lives in your hand once they know that you are a licensed practitioner. So this shows that in a medical school, in a medical college, a, per a person cannot be a certified medical doctor just simply by reading the book on his own. He has to spend um, a lot of time, number of hours on, in a supervised environment. <clears throat> Similarly, you know, and in, ima imagine if this person becomes a doctor without any license and without any residency and he starts prescribing medicines and he starts operating on people, then what is he going to do? He will, you know, Instead of curing people, he will send people more and more to the graveyard. So that's that's what he's going to do. I say that just simply by reading a recipe book. You know, nowadays there are so many uh, YouTube channels where you watch a person uh, making certain meal or dish and then you try to uh, do the same thing as that person is doing in the video. So you're learning from a person. There are a lot of uh, recipe books and if... Uh, you're given a recipe of making biryani, for instance, and then you uh, you try to make it, and you you do you did everything as it is mentioned in that recipe. 
perhaps you know you're you make something very close to it but it won't you will not gain you will not gain perfection just by simply following uh, the recipe in the book you have to learn from somebody who has expertise in that field you will become cook only when you go to the uh, to that school or you work under a chef so uh, you cannot be an expert cook just simply by reading a book so if these uh, minor things though food is not a minor thing but obviously in comparison to the dean it is a minor thing you need an expert uh, to 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 supervise to train you so why do we think about uh, dean and why do we uh, take it for granted and we think you know i can be an expert of my dean just simply by reading few translations of the quran and few books here and there in the hadith this attitude must change and this is the uh, gist of Surah Al-Anbiya, that only Kalamullah, no matter how much, uh, how many times you claim that you understood it, but you have not understood it without spending time under the supervision of your teacher, by learning your teacher and by, as, for, from your teacher and by associating yourself to that sacred link that is, that, that could take you to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, uh, respected brothers and sisters, um, there is a there is a very negative attitude of uh, certain people. For example, there is a group of people that think that we don't need people at all to train us and to teach us. If everything is crystal clear in the Quran, then let's just learn and seek advice directly from the Quran and minus and remove all the people. Uh, we we, we want to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. They must know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow anbiya to be connected to him directly. There was a link of Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam in between. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, even that wasn't a direct communication. There was a tree, the link of a tree in between. And why that link was there, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about his uh, secrets. We don't know and there are so many things that we cannot uh, give our opinion about. But one thing is clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uses a link uh, when he communicates with, with the slaves, even though slaves are anbiya and they are prophets and rusul. So how is it possible that one can think that I can be connected to Allah or to the kalamullah without any link, without any wasita? Imagine if you have a window in your room and the light, uh, the, the sunlight is coming through the window, then your, your room uh, is, is bright. So its brightness is because of the light, but the light is not coming directly, it's coming through the window. If you close the window, the light won't come in and the room, your room will not be bright. Similarly, our heart will become bright only when we open the window and the window is our teacher. So when the teacher allows that light, that nur, which is in the Quran and the Sunnah to come into our heart, then only we understand the Quran and the Sunnah, but we have to keep that window open. If we close the window, if we close the door, then the light, the nur of the Quran and the Sunnah will never get into our heart. So that's the first group of the people and these type of people who ignore the Rijal, the people who are appointed by Allah and who are their inheritors, in inheritors who ignore uh, these people, they eventually become uh, the rejectors of the Sunnah. Usually they think that, oh, since Quran is the uh, ultimate source of guidance, well, this uh, narrative and this proposition is right, but the way how this proposition is implemented is not right. So they think that uh, Quran, since it is the ultimate uh, source of guidance, let's not talk about Sunnah because in order to understand Sunnah, if I read through the Hadith, I find a lot of contradiction. And in order to resolve these problems and contradictions, then again, I have to go to the teacher and I don't want to go to a teacher. I am an expert by myself. So let's just ignore the Hadith. So this person ultimately becomes a rejecter of the Sunnah and you don't want to be a rejecter of the Sunnah because in most cases, these people um, eventually end up losing their Iman. In most cases, I'm not saying in all the cases. Then uh, that's the first group of the people. The second group of the people who just associate themselves to the Rijal, to that uh, line of guidance uh, people, and they ignore Kalamullah, they end up follow, falling in bid'ah. So that's why you will see people that they associate to, the, to the, themselves to different salas, different salasil, different mashayikh. And uh, statements of mashayikh for them is like the statement of Allah or the statement of the Quran or so and so Shaykh said that they are, that's it. I am going to do this uh, particular action because my Shaykh told, Shaykh told me. And if even if these people are told, no, this is against the Hadith, this is against the Ayah of the Quran. So uh, such people ignore all the Ahadith and all the Ayat of the Quran. So uh, they think that what my Shaykh or what my, uh, you know, 
peer or what my uh, so and so a person that I admire what he told me is his word is final his word is like wahi so these people give them a, a, a highest regard that they don't deserve and that's why the followers end up becoming bidatis so you don't want to be in one of the, uh, you don't want to you don't want to be uh, in any of these two groups you want to be in the middle a moderate muslim is a person who, uh, who 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 fulfills the right of both lines of guidance the rijalullah uh, and the kalamullah the people who are appointed by allah and the kalam that was sent by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's the main uh, point of Surah Al Anbiya, and this is the reason why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talked about Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, and the name of the Surah is Anbiya. It's, it's giving us a clear, straightforward message that you cannot understand the Quran on your own. Yes, there is an ayah. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرٍ that we have made the Quran easier for uh, dhikr. For dhikr means seeking seeking guidance. So imagine if you read the um, read a story or you read the uh, a story of the Quran or you read the translation of the Quran you can always seek the guidance uh, from the Quran that's you seeking guidance from the Quran you don't have to have a teacher but when you say I'm understanding the Quran without the help of a teacher without the support of a teacher that's where you're making a mistake and you will end up not understanding it and you will end up having lots of doubts in the Quran and uh, uh, that's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam otherwise Arabs uh, the, the mushrikeen and other Arabs, they were a lot eloquent and they had uh, full command and authority over the Arabic language, even more than the Arabs today in the Arab world. So uh, there was no need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam because uh, the, the addressee of the, of the book were native speakers. They could have just understood it on their own. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that if they tried to understand the Quran on their own, Perhaps there will be a lot of confusion in their mind, and the only way to clear the confusion is when Anbiya alayhi, when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would teach them uh, his uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala's beautiful words. Now, let's get uh, to this ayah, which is uh, in Surah Al Anbiya, mm -hmm. and it is ayah number ayah number twenty-two. Allah subhanahu wa taala says. لو كان فيهما آلهة إلا الله لفسدتا فسبحان الله رب العرش عما يصفون Had there been gods beside Allah in the heavens and the earth, both of them would have fallen in a disorder. This is an argument from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, on Tawheed that why Allah is one and why it is must that he is one and why we cannot have multiple gods, why we cannot have more than one god. <coughs> So in order to understand this, let me give you an example. Imagine, suppose for the sake of the argument, uh, imagine there are two gods. And uh, there is a person whose name is Abdullah. And one god intends that Abdullah moves. And the other god intends or wants that Abdullah doesn't move and he remains still. So if that's the case, and obviously, uh, what they're wanting, what they're intending is not impossible because Abdullah's movement and Abdullah, uh, him, him, him being, um, you know, without any move, him being, him being uh, still, both of them are possible. So both gods are intending something that is possible. It's not like one's wish is possible and the other's wish is impossible. No, both of them are wishing something that is possible. Abdullah's movement and him being still. Now, there are three options. The first option is that both of them, what they intended, they are able to fulfill it. So that is that would lead to a big, huge contradiction because it is not possible that Abdullah moves and at the same time he doesn't move. So him moving and not moving at the same time, that's not possible. So it's not, you can't say that the first option is correct. Why? Because both of these two contradictory things cannot happen at the same time, at the same moment to the same person. The second option is that none of them is able to fulfill his wish. For example, Abdullah doesn't move, neither he remains still. This option is wrong as well because, um, you know, if there is an object, the object is has only these two conditions. Either the object will move or will not move. There is no third uh, option. There is no. It's not possible that the object doesn't move and is not 
uh, is not still. There is no such possibility. So the second option that none of them is able to fulfill his wish or fulfill his or impose his intention, this option is false and is wrong. The third option is that one of the two gods is able to implement his wish. For example, the one who wanted Abdullah to move, so Abdullah moves. And the other god who wanted Abdullah not to move, he's not able to implement his wish. For, so Abdullah moves, rejecting the intention of the other god who didn't want him to move. If that's the case, then the other god who didn't want him to move and his wish and his will wasn't, it wasn't, able to, uh, wasn't implemented, so he's proven to be incapable of doing things. And the, the first God who intended Abdullah to move and Abdullah moved, he is capable of doing things. If that's the case, then the other God who's proven to be incapable of doing things obviously is disqualified to be God. And the first God who wanted Abdullah to move and he moved, since he is capable of doing things, therefore he's qualified to be a God. That proves that there is only one God and not two. Imagine if uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, take the same example and apply it on heaven and earth. Basically the entire universe. For instance, if there is a God, if there are two gods or multiple gods, uh, some of them wanted to, to destroy, not to uh, initiate the creation of the universe. And one God wanted to initiate the creation of the universe. He wanted to create the universe. The other didn't want to create the universe. So obviously, if that's the case, then we will apply all three options there. The first is wrong. The second is wrong. The third is right that uh, one's intention is, uh, uh, is, is, is fulfilled and the other in other's intention is not fulfilled. So the God who wanted to create the universe, he created it. And the God who didn't want to create the universe, he failed. So if that's the case, if the second God failed, he's disqualified to be a God. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ Lafasadata. So uh, this Dalil is very clear, straightforward, and it is something that you know even Awamun Nas Layman can understand. So the beginning of Suratul Suratul Anbiya talks about the evidences and arguments on the oneness of Allah, the wujud, the existence of Allah. <clears throat> For example, in ayah number um, 30, ayah number 30. And what I what, why I'm uh, mentioning these ayat because <clears throat> Keep one thing in mind that Quran is never against these scientific facts. What science is discovering, and if they are facts, mm -hmm. Quran has already talked about those facts. As for scientific theories, uh, they may be they may be against the Quran, and we don't really care about that because theories are there to change. And this is a, this is the problem of many Muslims that as soon as they see they think, oh, this this uh, scientific theory is becoming very popular and it, it's it's trending now. So let's see if this theory exists in the Quran and they find one or two verses and they twist it and they just interpret it on their own uh, without any you know source and uh, using this uh, this term called uh, called uh, Quranic hermeneutics and. Uh, they, 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 they prove that theory from the Quran, which is totally false. This attitude is not right. Yes, if this is if there is a scientific fact, then Quran definitely has talked about those facts way before science is able to discover. So in the in this ayah number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is proving his own existence. He's saying, Did the disbelievers not observe that the heavens and the earth were closed? Uh, then we open them. So basically, this is what the science, uh, modern science calls uh, now uh, as a Big Bang. But you know, not everybody is aware of the Big Bang theory, though we call it theory, but it's in, uh, in fact, it has become a fact now that this is how the universe started as a result of a huge, massive explosion from this level called singularity. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, but remember one thing that not everybody uh, knows about the Big Bang. Only those people who have proper schooling or who had gone to the school and perhaps they've completed their high school, uh, perhaps they're the one who are aware of the Big Bang. Otherwise, uh, people who are not educated, they're not aware of the Big Bang theory. People who don't, who, who, who never got the opportunity to go to the school, they don't, they're not aware of this theory. They're not aware of how uh, the massive explosion took place 14, some 14 billion years ago. Uh, yes, one thing they're aware of, they're aware of the earth, they're aware of the sky. The sky means or the blue thing that they see, 
during the daytime, which is the open space. There, everybody is aware of it. Whether a person who lives in the middle of nowhere and even a nomad, he knows uh, these two things. Similarly, a, a, an expert in science, a scientist, a medical doctor, an engineer, an IT professional, all of these people know these two things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not use the word or the term Big Bang because this book is not the book of science. This is the book of Hidayah and it is for all. It is not only for the educated people. It is for educated people. It is for common people. It is for laymen. It is for nomads. It is for people living in the in cities. It is for people living in villages. It is pe for people who had the opportunity to go to the school. It is for everybody. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used an expression that everyone is able to understand. So that's why instead of using the word Big Bang, he said, Did the disbelievers not observe that the heavens and the earth, because everybody knows about the heavens and the earth, were closed, meaning they were at the singularity level. And that's when, And we opened them. So when, imagine if there is a tiny, a bomb and it explodes so everything that is closed in it opens up and uh, all the particles you know they fly around and uh, damaging the property and people so this is the nature of the explosion so fataqna huma fataqa is uh, to have an explosion fataqna huma so we open them meaning from the singularity level we caused this explosion to happen and that's how the universe came into being and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we have created every living thing from water. Now, uh, imagine 1400 years ago when the Quran was addressing to uh, the people who had no scientific background. They were uh, simple people. Uh, most of them were laymen. Most of them were un uneducated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about this great scientific phenomena. This is what the science discovered today. Uh, you know, if you if you're this uh, bi biological concept of uh, uh, cytoplasm so there is a cell in every uh, living thing's body and this is the primary cell it's called cytoplasm and cytoplasm as uh, if you read about it it's 80 percent of it is uh, composed of water so water is in the in the primary cell of every living thing so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we have created every living thing from water so imagine if you take a bug and you smash it you don't see any water in there there's no blood there but even it has that cell which is composed of 80 percent water so if that's the case did they not observe this if they have observed this, then how come they don't believe? Still, you don't believe in, in the existence of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about those uh, facts that the science is now discovering 1400 years ago to people who had no scientific background in a language that's very, very clear, straightforward. It has no ambiguity in it. And it is quite simple. It is not a scientific language that in order to understand that you have to have some uh, school mm -hmm. background. Uh, non, uh, you know, you know, common people won't be able to understand or get those terms. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm reading ayah number 30, uh, 32. We made the sky a protected roof. Now, a lot of people, there is this objection. You know, what, what do you mean by sky? There is no sky. Look at up. What the, the bluish thing you see is uh, is an open space. It's nothing. Okay. This is it turns dark when the sun uh, sets. So when the sun rises, it becomes blue. So that's that's not solid thing. Why did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala call it a roof and not only a roof? He called it a protected roof. So where is that roof? <clears throat> now uh, remember that. The word uh, as sama is used in the Quran for various different uh, meanings. In fact, in Arabic language, in the classical language, the word as sama is used for anything that is high and above. In the Quran itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in one of the ayat this word for clouds. Sama is used for clouds. So anything that is high and above, the word as sama is used for that. Now, what is that thing which is protecting us? And it is up, it is protecting us from being destroyed so if you um if you if you are interested in uh, in science perhaps uh, you're aware of this that there are seven different layers of the atmosphere and those seven layers ozone is one of them and those layers are protecting us 
against uh, ultraviolet rays, against uh, X-rays and uh, the, 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 the rays that are emitted from the sun, that if those, uh, uh, you know, layers are not there, those seven layers are not there, these rays would have killed us all by now. In fact, no living thing can survive. Uh, that's how dangerous those rays are. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these uh, layers that we may not be able to see with naked eyes, but these layers are definitely acting as a uh, as a roof, which is a per, which is uh, this roof is protecting us and protecting every single uh, living thing. And that's why if when you cross this, um, you know, you go to the outer space and you are outside of these seven uh, rays. Now you don't you need the space suit, the astronaut suit in order to survive. Otherwise, you'll be burned right there. You'll be killed. Uh, right away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is possible that the word as I'm not saying this is the only interpretation, but it definitely, uh, you know, he's talking about a clear, uh, a protected roof, a roof that protects people. Um, so that description matches with the seven layers of the, of our atmosphere. So it is possible that it is talking about those seven layers of the atmosphere, but definitely this objection against the Quran doesn't stand valid that uh, which roof is uh, are you talking about which roof is allah talking about there's no such roof up uh, you know in the space so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that after witnessing and observing all of these signs they are still averse to his signs you know after uh, reading the quran and after having understood and after simply reading the translation of the Quran that Allah Azza wa Jal 1400 years ago in his kalam addressing to common people who did not have any scientific background were talking about the scientific phenomenon that now the modern science discovered and now people started learning slowly uh, in their schools and colleges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about these things uh, uh, way long ago. So this is a clear sign that this kalam cannot be from a human being. Uh, this kalam definitely is from the creator. This kalam is definitely from our master and our Lord. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us, the entire human being, the entire mankind too, that we uh, believe in Allah, we believe in his authority, we believe in the fact that he is the creator. So um, today's khulasa and the, the, the conclusion is, that if one claims or wishes to learn the deen without the supervision of his teacher, he can never do that. And therefore, my advice to you all, that if you are, definitely we are all hungry for knowledge, we're thirsty for knowledge. So we need knowledge. And if that's the case, and of course, if it is about our deen, we definitely we want to have proper knowledge. And nowadays, on, with the help of social media, you see a lot of scholars, you see a lot of people, uh, you know, sharing their knowledge uh, with you. In fact, right now you're watching me and, uh, you know, I'm also sharing uh, a bit of knowledge that I have, uh, which is not actually my own knowledge. I also learn from my teachers. So it's their knowledge and they learn from their teacher. So the, in the, the main criteria that you have to look for in that person is that what is his sanat? What is his chain? And uh, Sanat is not required only in a Hadith. Sanat is required basically in the entire field uh, of uh, Dini expertise. So if this scholar or this person who is on the on your screen, whom you watch, you're, you're a big fan of that person, you follow that person for his knowledge or because he's a very good speaker, because he's very famous, uh, you know, his speeches are uh, heard everywhere. He's invited by... Uh, you know, uh, in, in big events, that's why you follow him. It's absolutely fine. No problem. As long as this person has a proper background, background in a sense that he is linked to his teachers and his teachers are linked to their teachers and their teacher had connection to their teachers. And that's how the silsila goes back all the way to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But if you see somebody that a person became scholar just out of nowhere, he, you know, he just popped up as a scholar and uh, suddenly he started giving his speeches and uh, you know his videos are now uh, trending because you know he's he's becoming famous now the question is that why is he becoming famous uh, you know the problem is that only those scholars so called scholars become famous who tell you that everything is halal the moment, the moment a person says no this is haram people go away from him because you know that's not my kind of scholar my kind of scholar my kind of scholar is that who tells me everything is halal so if you find somebody 
who, who tells you that everything is halal and who tells you that all what you have been doing so far is totally incorrect. And let me tell you uh, what I got. Let me tell you what I have and let me tell you my understanding. Then watch out and stay away from such a person because his example is like an uncertified doctor. Imagine if you have a flu, if you have a minor fever, you have a cold or cough and you go to this doctor and he prescribes some medications for you. Those medications might work. But if imagine this person uh, continues going to visiting this uncertified doctor, unlicensed doctor for uh, a constant fever. And every time this person visits the, the doctor, the doctor gives him the same medication. And after some time, when he went to the hospital and uh, the proper testing was done, he discovered that, oh, he has a cancer and the cancer in its last stage. And then who would he curse now? He would have, he should have cursed himself. Why were you visiting all his this time uh, to a, an uncertified and unlicensed doctor? So yes, his medica med prescribed medications were working to some for minor issues. But when this minor, these minor issues become major, now what's going to happen? So similarly, if you watch these types of people, they, you might like some of uh, you know the stuff that they're saying some of the knowledge that they're sharing with you you might like but eventually they will take you to a place to a uh to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to an extent that coming back from there will be very difficult and that's why rasulullah said in the hadith that towards the end of time there will be people who will give fatwa without any knowledge they themselves will be astray and they will drive people astray so i make dua that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from such people and give us proper understanding of the quran and sunnah and allow us to stay connected with that beautiful chain that goes back to rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam inshallah see you tomorrow wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh